Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Hilary Carr, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Christy Tate, presenting her debut memoir, Group, How One Therapist and a Circle of Strangers Saved My Life, joined in conversation by Sarah Heppola. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight. Through events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these unprecedented times. Every week we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule appears, also appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any point throughout the talk tonight, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase group on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these past few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quick, quickly, and we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Christy Tate is an award-winning writer and essayist whose work has been published in the New York Times, The Rumpus, The Washington Post, and McSweeney's, among many other outlets. Her essay, Promised Lands, was selected by Kiese Lehman as the winner of the New, New Ohio Review's 2019 Nonfiction Award. Tonight, Christy will be joined by Sarah Heppola, author of the memoir, Blackout, Remembering the Things I Drank to Forget. These two will be discussing Christy's memoir, Group, which is the latest pick for Reese Witherspoon's book club, and NPR said of Group that it is a pleasure to watch as Tate's peers help her transform. And author and memoirist Danny Shapiro wrote in the New York Times that Tate's hard-won willingness to become, to become loving and to be loved ultimately shapes a story that has a lot of heart one that goes straight to the messy center of what it means to interrogate our own limitations and deepest desires wherever that journey may take us. We're so happy to have them both here with us tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Sarah and Christy. Thank you. Hi, hi, Christy. Hey, Sarah. Hey, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for taking time tonight. I know it's a crazy time. It's, uh, it means a lot to me that you would spend some time with me and Sarah and talking about group. I'm grateful. Um, so I'm going to be moderating this thing. And I just want to say before we start, like I'm doing this because, um, well, because you asked me. Um, but no, no, I'm no, out of sheer obligation. Um, no, I'm doing this because I love this book. And, um, you know, I read it again when we were, I was getting ready for this. And, you know, it's one, I think your Amazon review says this, like it's, you know, they would say about books, like you'll laugh, you'll cry, but like, really, you'll laugh, you'll cry. Like I really, I was crying at the end of this and I laughed so hard. And just to be able to do that and put it into book form is an extraordinary thing. So I, I wanna congratulate you on that. Thank you. Thank you. That's that how you described my book is how I feel about group therapy most of the time. Lots of laughing, lots of crying, <laughs> also screaming, but um, hopefully my book doesn't make people scream. It's the full human experience. Um, so yeah, so uh, as was mentioned, you I also want to congratulate you on getting uh, the Reese Witherspoon's uh, book pick. That's huge. Um, and so I have never experienced that. And so my question to you is, how does that happen? Does Reese show up on your doorstep with an enormous check? I hope. Um, uh, that hasn't happened yet. Okay, um, yet. Um, so I, back in January, I went to go see Kylie Reed speak and she wrote this amazing novel, Such a Fun Age. And she had just been picked as the Reese, um, the Reese book pick I think of January and I went to see her and I sat in the front row and somebody asked the question I hope that they would ask that I wanted to ask which is so did you meet Reese and she was like y'all I did not get to meet Reese and I was like oh that's such a bummer and so that is true for me too um, I have not yet met Reese but I have to say she has an incredible team of 
really, they seem really young, um, really smart, motivated, um, a diverse group of people who have helped um, helped me promote the book within Reese's world and in my own. And it's, it's totally like hitting the lottery. I could never reach the amount of people that Reese Witherspoon can reach. So I'm really, I'm still pretty gobsmacked by the whole thing. It's amazing. An enormous check would be nice on your front door, the big oversized one, but that's just my notes for Reese if she's watching. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh -huh. right. So, so you and I both wrote a memoir and one of the most common questions asked of people that do write memoirs is why would you ever do such a thing? Um, so, so tell me a little bit about why, why write a memoir? That's a great question. And I would have never written a memoir if I, if there didn't already exist this rich tradition of writing that has meant so much to me and not to embarrass you, but I'm a hundred percent including your book in that list of people and the list of books. And I'm a, I'm a reader before I was ever a writer. I was a reader and I always wanted to read a true story and those were the ones that kept me up all night turning the pages. And when I started writing myself, all of my true stories had some kind of light in them that I couldn't pre-produce in fiction. And I tried because I thought that's what you're supposed to write. I thought only really famous people, Oprah's and the Obama's should write memoir. And I didn't think I had, like many memoirists, I didn't think I had a story that was worthy of other people's time and money. And the more I read widely, and then I found teachers, I sort of found my way. And the question I've gotten most often so far since group has come out is, basically, aren't you ashamed <laughs> of everything you wrote down? Yeah. And I've been circling the answer and I, it just came to me this afternoon. I'm, n I'm not ashamed. And part of that is because all the work I did in therapy. But the reason I'm not ashamed is because so many people went before me. Like if anybody's ever read anything by Samantha Irby, it's hilarious and it's carnal and it's about her bowels. And if I could be that bold and that generous, then I feel like I will be giving the gift that she gives. And so I find myself comforted by all the people who went before me. And that, that makes me feel really proud and honored and kind of weepy, actually. I love that. You know, there's this funny thing where people sometimes also they do this thing where they go like, oh, it's so brave. And you're like, what do you what do you mean by that exactly? I always wonder if people are trying to say like, you're so brave, I would never do that. You shouldn't have done that. I wonder if you sense people having that kind of reaction sometimes. A hundred percent. I've had I've had so many discussions about the word brave as yeah. applied to women's memoirs, me, women who write memoir. And I've, I've found like shades of different meaning. And, you know, when a young woman says to me, oh my God, I too have an apple thing at night because I'm scared to binge on real food, but I will binge on apples. It was brave of you to write that. That to me feels like a connecting kind of brave, mm -hmm. but if there's a way to say it that feels more like distancing. And so when I, and there's a lot of times when I want to describe writing and what I, instead of saying brave, which I feel like is, has a ribbon of shame through it, like shame on you, lady, don't you know, we don't talk about what we do in the bathroom or whatever. Right. The word that I've chosen to highlight instead of brave is generous. I think it's generous for an author. So that has my gratitude in it instead of the, oh, I can't believe you said that quality, which is a way to distance yourself from whenever the person has generously written about. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to keep that because yeah, brave feels like a, like a, like a too freighted of a word or something like that. I don't like, I don't like it. Um, I agree. Uh, so, so let's talk about where this book begins. Um, you were 26 years old and you were the top of your class and you were finding yourself thinking about dying. Yes. Why were you so unhappy? I was unhappy because 
finding out I was the top student in my law class while simultaneously driving through Cabrini Green in Chicago, hoping to be shot. It was like the end of the road for me on the false idea that a achievement was going to fix what I knew was wrong with me and had been wrong with me for a long, long time. And how I would have talked about it then, it's not that different than how I talk about it now. It's, I didn't know how to attach to people. I didn't know how to have any kind of intimate relationships. I thought being vulnerable meant telling stories about my pratfalls and making myself the butt of a joke. I didn't know that real intimacy was sharing when I was angry or telling people what I did it with food at night or having a roommate so that they could see up close the things that I was hiding from the world. And so I knew when the book opens and I'm, you know, poised to be the valedictorian and I had no joy about it whatsoever. I thought, this is it. This is, I'm never going to find the outside thing that's going to fix my true longings, which had nothing to do with achievement or being number one. And that mask no longer worked. And so you find your way to into therapy. Um, you had been in a 12 step group before, but what was your, what, was, what were some of your fears about therapy? What were some of your, your reservations maybe? And tell us a little bit about the person that you found. Sure, I think my reservations, and it's hard to think now, were they true reservations or were they just defenses? I guess those are the same thing, right? I yeah. thought how completely self-indulgent to spend gobs and gobs of money. I mean, it was so inflated in my head yes, therapy is expensive, but by, I had built it up into my head to where it was like $500 a session. That's, that's not how much it is. And there's many, many ways to get therapy and payment plans and sliding scales, but I didn't know about any of that. And so I was, I was, I degraded the idea of it in part because I thought it was for rich people or trust fund people. I also clung for many years to the idea that I should only need a 12 step program. And if I wasn't getting well and my dreams weren't coming true, I wasn't working the steps hard enough. I wasn't, I hadn't done a thorough enough fourth step or all the, you know, there's 12 steps. I, I could easily have shirked on one or two. And so I really believed that in some ways, if I sought out therapy, it felt like a betrayal of all that the 12 step program had given me but I finally had to concede I needed something more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, and, and so I so I stumbled into this therapy, which sort of met these criteria. A friend of mine who did happen to be very affluent <laughs> mentioned her therapist, but she said the magic words, it's cheap. And it was cheap because it's group, which, you know, cuts the price by a third into a third of what it would be otherwise. And what I saw in her is a change and there was a, a light on inside of her and she seemed like a person who something had happened and she attributed it to her therapist. So I went to go see him, this cheap therapy, and he was so cocky and confident and was like, we can get you where you want to go. We can fill your lives, your life with relationships. And I was so caught off guard by his non by his bold assertions that I, I pursued what he was offering. By the way, is, is Dr. Rosen his real name? No, that's not his real name. <laughs> I've been getting emails from people. Can you tell me the name, the real name of your therapist? I can't find Jonathan Rosen anywhere. <laughs> I'm like, well, sure that's getting Googled. <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny to check. Um, okay, so you are going to do a little reading for us. Do you want to do that now and maybe set it up, whatever, whatever you need as a setup? Sure. So I'll just read a quick passage. This is my very, so I've called Dr. Rosen and I've left a message and now it's sort of go time. Um, and I'll just read a little bit. I found Dr. Rosen's number in the phone book and left a message on his machine two hours after my dinner with Marnie. He called me back the next day. Our conversation lasted less than three minutes. I asked for an appointment. He offered me a time and I took it. When I hung up, 
I stood up in my office, my whole body shaking. Twice I sat down to resume my legal research and both times I popped out of my seat 30 seconds later to pace. My mind insisted that making a doctor's appointment was no big deal, but the adrenaline coursing through me hinted otherwise. That night I wrote, I got off the phone and burst into tears. I felt like I said the wrong stuff and he doesn't like me and I felt exposed and vulnerable. I didn't care if he could help me. I cared about whether or not he liked me. The waiting room consisted of bland doctor's office fare, an Easter lily, a grayscale photograph of a man stretching his arms outward and turning his face toward the sun. The bookshelf held titles like Codependent No More and Vandalized Love Maps and dozens of AA newsletters. Next to the inner door, there were two buttons, one labeled group and one labeled Dr. Rosen. I pressed the Dr. Rosen button to announce myself and then settled in a chair along the wall facing the door. To calm my nerves, I grabbed a National Geographic and flipped through the pictures of the majestic Arctic sea wolf gall galloping across a treeless plain. On the phone, Dr. Rosen had sounded serious. I heard East Coast vowels. I heard an unsmiling gravitas. I heard a stern, humorless priest. Part of me had hoped he'd be too booked to see me for a few weeks or months, but he offered an appointment 48 hours later. The waiting room door swung open at exactly 1.30. A slight middle-aged man in red Tommy Hilfinger golf shirt, khaki pants, and black leather loafers opened the door. His face wore a slight smile, friendly but professional, and what was left of his wiry grayish hair stuck up all over his head, slightly reminiscent of Einstein. If I passed him on the street, I would never look twice. From a quick glance, I could tell he was too young to be my dad and too old to want to fuck, which seemed ideal. I followed him down the hall to an office where northern windows looked out over the multi-story Marshall Fields building. There were several patient seating options, a scratchy looking upholstered couch, an upright office chair, or a black oversized armchair next to a desk. I chose the black armchair. A slew of Harvard diplomas drew my eye. I respected the Harvard thing. I'd had Ivy League dreams, but state school finances and test scores. To me, those Ivy League certificates signified that this guy was top tier, elite, creme de la creme. But it also meant that if he couldn't help me, then I was truly and deeply fucked. I'll stop there. Awesome. Um, so, I, I also want to uh, just pause for a moment and remind people in the audience that we're going to be doing uh, questions at the end of this. Uh, in about 20 minutes, we'll stop and pivot over there. So if you have any, to put them in the Q&A uh, panel on the bottom of the screen. Um, yeah, so, okay, so group therapy. Uh, I have never done group therapy. And uh, before I picked up your book, um, I have to admit that I had a little bit of a, like, I don't know why I had such a resistance to it. Um, it's like, it made me really uncomfortably, like very uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, I think there's this thing in me where I'm like, but, but do I have to do it in public? Like, do I have to show other people? And it's just such a human instinct to want to like, you're in pain and you want to hide and you want to like tighten the radius. Um, with, you know, not expand the radius of your embarrassment. So I guess my question to you is, why can't I do this on my own? Why do you need other people? That, I think that's a totally valid question. And to tell you the truth, I don't know that you can't. Plenty of people do. A lot of people get well with their therapist and they go forth and have relationships and get married and get into families and I just knew, well, I say, this is a self-serving narrative, right? Because I can look back and say, well, I had to do it this way. And it had to take 7.5 years, whatever. But I think what, what I believe, and from what I've seen, obviously, in my own life, but I've also been there almost 20 years, I've seen a lot of people come in the circle with a variety of maladies and pressing problems. Um, at the heart of them, 
a lot of the the heart of a lot of them have to do with relationships with other people and how to how to get along in the world in a better way and i think what what i know for me about group is that it gave me the chance to really see in real time on in six different relationships all spotlit what i was doing that was getting in my own way and i could be called out if i'm doing dysfunction something dysfunctional in my relationship with rory for example and she's hurt my feel she said something snarky or nasty and i'm just sitting there being hurt and quiet and victimy there's five other people who are watching me cower disappear withhold and i get essentially called out and i have the opportunity to examine what i just what had just happened what i could do differently and have all the support of those eyes and hearts saying well could you tell her or could you i mean before i could do the mature i feel hurt i had to do first i withdrew because that was my thing and then i learned how to just snark back like claws out and eventually i got to the point where a thing can happen in group and i could say I feel really hurt by that. I'm still pretty snarky though. <laughs> My group mates may be on here. I better tell the total truth. I can still be really, really snarky and I can also still withhold, but at least I could see it. It's laid bare in a way that it just sped things up. I never, I'd had some individual um, therapy. Now, I lied through my teeth through all of it and mm -hmm. I performed for therapists and I also tried to take care of therapists. So that's truly why it didn't work. So it's hard to evaluate because I ruined the experiment, but I also, nothing dynamic was ever happening. I mean, that's probably because of my lies, but I just liked how instantly in group, there was kind of no hiding and the work begins the minute you sit down, even in the waiting room, sometimes shit gets started in the waiting room and it spills into the group. And I just, I like the, I like the dynamism. Yeah. I was, I was reminded several times during the book of how, of like the lessons of discomfort, mm. because I think so often we want to feel comfortable and we want to be comforted and comforting to other people, but that growth comes from pushing out of that uh that is such that is so well put i think for me i don't know why this is and one one thing i love about how group worked because we were doing things real time and the relationships we're all having there's not a lot of tell us about your mother tell us about your <laughs> uncle there that comes up kind of organically, but it's not a, there's not a, a ton of excavation. It's more like, what are you doing now? And can you see your part and what you've just done to be alone or alienated by the group or scapegoated or whatever. And so I think that that notion of discomfort, when I arrived in my chair with Dr. Rosen, I had dated fallen deeply in love and obsession with one alcoholic or drug addicted man after another. Obviously there was something comfortable about that. And Dr. Rosen, after about a year of me talking about unavailable men and how I, they, I only like unavailable men, we had to start working on my unavailability and my, his, his thesis, which I thought was ridiculous was if there were an available gainfully employed hygienic man who wanted to be with me i would run the other way and i was like that's not true there aren't any those men don't exist in right. chicago and his thesis proved true and it's because i had to work through the discomfort of a true intimate relationship instead of chasing a man who wants to drink or be alone that was sort of my mo you know uh I really love, uh, there's so much that I love about the book, but you know, you have this issue with um, unavailable men that many of us, many of us do, possibly me. Um, and, and people always say, you know, these th things about, you know, make yourself more available or choose differently, but you don't see how to do it. And one of the things I love about this book is that we get to watch you learning the how. 
and it's so powerful. Um, and there was something that that Dr. Rosen said to you that I really thought about a lot. Um, he said, if you can't say no in a relationship, then you can't be intimate. And it's so interesting, you know, I, I think I was thinking about, but wait a minute, but like, if you love someone, you have to say yes. And so I wondered if you could think, if you could tell me a little bit about what that, like learning to say no meant to you. I, I just, I still remember that day. I remember what I was wearing. I remember what chair I was sitting in because it really hit me between the eyes because I thought, I thought my primary virtue in a relationship is that I was a yes girl. People, people want to hear yes. Will you help me? Yes. Will you hold this? Will you take my shift? Will you suck my dick? Like they want to hear yes. And I thought, well, I don't know what else I have to offer, but I will give you my yes. And to hear that no, when he said that, I couldn't think of an example where I genuinely said no. Instead of saying no, I said yes with resentment and then, and then festered. And then there was a thing, right, in the relationship, my resentment, which means I'm unavailable, or I would ghost, or I would lie, or I would say yes, and then like, oh, I, I forgot my exam, like kind of play a flaky thing. I'm not, I'm not flaky, but I had to play that because I couldn't just say no. It's still, still to this day, one of the hardest things I have to do. And I'm still, you know, like they say, this is like, I mean, I feel like this is a Dr. Phil thing. Like, no is a complete sentence. You don't have to give an explanation ever. I'm still, how many years into this, I still am like, I can't because my kid has the flu and um, the car, like, and those are all true things. I, I don't feel like, it's still very uncomfortable for me to say, thank you for asking, but I am not available. Or just, I still can't just know. That just seems so mean. <laughs> I can't do it. It makes me tense. Um, so, you know, people have probably caught on if they didn't know this already. You are very funny. Um, you are a funny woman and a funny, funny writer. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask about the use of humor. You know, uh, laughter is healing, but laughter can, all, uh, jokes can also be a defense mechanism. And so for you in your own writing, like how do you keep it one and not the other? That's, that's so interesting. And I realized last night when somebody was asking me about this, I was called out. I have been called out ver at various times in group about making a joke, dodging the deep work with just a, a, a quip. Like, I feel like my wit or my sass or my irreverence, and it serves me in many, many ways. But it can also, as you just said, be a crutch. And so I remember being called out when something intense was happening in group. And Dr. Rosen said to me, you know, you, you, you don't have to do that. And it, the, way, the phrasing was really, really important to me. He didn't say don't do that, which mm -hmm. is probably what I would have said. Um, he said, you don't have to. You can pick a different mode of being. You can do something different here and end up in a different place. Interestingly, fast forward 10 years, I had um, a right, actually it was Lydia Yuknovich and she was, I was workshopping with her and there were almost the exact same spot in the manuscript. She was like, you're being awfully glib about a really intense thing. I can't believe this is how you actually felt. And I was like, there was still that mechanism inside of me that's like, oh, I don't want to bum my readers out. <laughs> She's like, are you kidding me? Like they're holding, there's a scene where I'm holding the ashes of a baby and in a tin can. And she's like, this is not the time for that. You can use that in other scenes. You can do something different here, which almost precisely echoed what Dr. Rosen said. And just thinking about it now, it gives me chills, but it can definitely be used for good or for to hide. And nobody wants to read a writer who's hiding. Yeah, I find that so interesting. And it's really interesting how your people pleasing mechanism got activated in both situations, which I totally relate to. And I think there's this thing where the the writer is like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, like you said, I don't want to bum them out. It's, it's the same thing of like, um, if you can't say no, it's not intimacy. Like you have to hold still mm -hmm. or the whole dynamic. Um, 
and you have, you know, it, it's, that's just so interesting. Um, well, I would say also too, that's another instance of using the reader the same way I would use these unavailable men. That's my excuse for not going deeper on the page and telling the reader, what does it actually look like for someone who's held a traumatic experience in her body for 20 years or however long it was at the time, maybe more than 20, what does it actually look like to go in and to spill that in group after telling myself for decades, I wasn't allowed to, I should be over it. The traumatic situation involved a family friend's father. So forever I thought, well, it's not my sadness. It wasn't my dad. And there was always an excuse to not do the work. Plus I didn't have the right support. So then when it was time, it was not a jokey situation at all. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I, I really love about this book is that it brings, it illuminates how slow change is. Yes. And I think that's one of the hardest things for people to accept and, and get their head around. I mean, there's, there's, there's passages in there where you're saying like, I've been in this thing two years and nothing's happened. And that's just like, it's so frustrating people. And we live in this world of quick fixes and instant gratification and yet real change almost works at a turtle's pace, if even that. Um, what, how do you stay in it when the haul is that long? And what do you say to somebody who's feeling really frustrated for how slow this is, this process is? Uh, that to me was one of the bigger stumbling blocks because when I came in to group, other people, like I came in the same day as another guy in my group. Meanwhile, in within the first two years, he's getting engaged, he's getting married, he's having awesome sex in the shower. And I'm like, I can't even date a man who takes a shower. And I, I was so enraged by that. And then I started in the second half of the book, I joined a second group and there was a woman who came in after me, actually more than one, they came in after me Within a year, they're married. I'm going to their weddings with no date. And I feel like I didn't write this book to help people. It's, it's not a self-help book. But one of the things I feel really, really clear about is I want there to be more stories that show show the slowness and the, the forwards and backwards, like true recovery. I feel like so many recovery, I mean, I assume this is a recovery story in my mind it is. Like, it's like, you get sober, you work the steps, boom, life of service. And it's like, that didn't happen to me. I got into recovery, I did okay with my food and then I was suicidal and I needed a ton of therapy to like have a friend. And I want more stories because people think if they've done a year of therapy and they don't feel better, or maybe they feel better, but they still don't have their heart's longings, it feels like it doesn't work. And at least my story I know is out there and it's not, I don't get fixed. I mean, I will never, but I don't get the things I went for, for more than five years. And I told him in the first day when I saw him, I said to Dr. Rosen, if you can't fix me in five years, you know, get me some relationships, I'm going to kill myself. And really, in my head, I was like, it's never going to take five years. I was just trying to seem patient and like evolved. And I was like, no way. And then he we just sort of went with that trope of the five years. And you know, a lot changed, but I didn't have all the things I wanted. And five years is a long time. Those were my, that was my youth. It's gone. No, I love what you said. And, and change is so slow and it never gets portrayed that way. I feel like because you can go from chapter one to chapter three and maybe five years passed when the person's life, it was three years, you know, yeah. we get to see that slow crawl. This is also true of the artistic process. You know, I think people have a fantasy that books get written like that. And what actually happens is that sometimes they take years and they take drafts and they take many, many versions. And so can you talk a little bit about at what point do you realize you're writing a book and then how long does it take you? Sure. I. I had been, I had started writing um, I, probably like more than 10 years ago. And I was just like, it was something fun. I love to do it. I quickly became a little bit obsessive about it because that's sort of my, I'm either not doing it or I'm all in. And I wrote an, a couple of novels and they were not 
successful. And I just, I knew that what it takes to write something required years and some training. And I kept looking at those, um, for anybody who does writing, you've probably seen like the beat sheets, like what, what's, what are the parts of a novel? And I was like, I should look at that. And I didn't understand what they said. Like, I didn't know what a pinch point was. I didn't know what these reversals and I read McKee and I just was like, I don't know what any of this is. And so I just took a month off of writing and was just like, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to be really still. And in that time, I think I read Wild by Cheryl Strayed and I loved it. And, and then I was sitting at my desk. I mean, literally like looking out the window one day, supposed to be working in my day job. And all of a sudden I could see, I could see the arc of group. I could see, this was November the 9th of 2015. And I wrote it on a little purple index card. I was like, oh, this is kind of what they're talking about. Like you go forward, you go backwards. You know, I tried to look at the Campbell, the, the hero's journey. And I was like, that was just too heady for me. I was just like, I want a story that is true and that I was here and then I got to somewhere different. That's like the most I could sort of hold. And I started writing about it. And so I, I mean, that was November of 2015. And it's, it's like, I didn't have to, I knew all the things that had happened and it took, it took five, four years to shape, to shape it. And a lot of drafts, like, I, I don't know, seven or eight, what counts as a draft? I don't know, but I had to do a bunch because at first it was just a collection of, it was like a collection of this happened. Where's my boyfriend? This happened. Fuck Dr. Rosen. This happened. I'm still not having sex. So I was like, so it was like kind of a, it was a little bit bitter and it was disjointed. It wasn't, it was like vignettes that didn't have like, I guess a through line. I still don't know all the technical terms, but it took a long time and a lot of eyes and a lot of support and a lot of group to get it to be a book. Um, so I want to remind people if they have questions to put them in the Q&A box. We've got several um, already in here and we'll turn to that in just a second. So what does the group think of the book group? <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> um, We've had a long journey with this book and group, um, as you can imagine, and I feel really grateful. Some of those sessions were really uncomfortable. I had group mates who were like, before I'd sent them electronic copies, but before you just tear into your group mates 250 page thing they sent you in the dark of night, there were, we had to work through the issues, right? Have I exploited them? Have I properly guarded their privacy? Have I, have I done the right ethical, have I made the right ethical choices before even undertaking the project? And so we talked about this a lot. And um, so now Monday we had group the day before, and I have to say, because we've done all this work, there's been a feeling that we're all in this together. Like, it's sort of like, this is our book. And I feel incredibly grateful to have this company, right? Because this is a wild, wild ride. And um, I think for the, I think they're proud of me. Like Mama Patrice, who's in the book, she's, she's so proud of me. She said to me after she read it, we were walking down the street and she said, I can't believe how loving you were to, to all of us. <laughs> I was like, I really do love you. What, how do I act in group? Um, so I think that it's, um, pe people have complicated relationships to it. There's one group member who's never going, she's, sh I think she's never going to read it. And I understand that. And I don't have a, I don't have a need for her to read it. We've, that's, each relationship is different. And what, what each group mate needs in our relationship is different. And I respect that. Um, but I feel like now, now it's just like part of the fabric of our story, of our group story. One of the things is one of us wrote a book about it. And so now we have, this is part of our lore now. I love that. Um, so I'm gonna turn to some of the questions that have come in from the audience. This one's from an anonymous attendee. So she says, thank you so much, Christy, for sharing your journey. I attended my first DBT group therapy 359 days ago, and my life has completely changed. 
Learning how to observe and name my feelings has been eye-opening. Hearing your story gives me hope. Thank you for your vulnerability. Do you have any advice for balancing asking for help and not being a burden to those closest to you? Ooh. Well, first of all, congratulations. Um, that's awesome. Na I hope the naming feelings thing. Okay, I'll answer your question instead of reminiscing. Um, I think for me, I've had to really err on the side of letting myself be a burden. Part of what made me the dysfunctional figure that I was back then is not asking for help. And this sense, I didn't want to be a burden. So for me, I feel like it's better to err on the side of being a burden. And also one of the things that mitigates that for me today in my life is I try to have a lot of sources that I go to. I have, I have a wide range of people that I go to. I don't always go, I don't, outside of group, for example, I don't always call the same group member. Um, when I have struggles around my kids and remote schooling, I have several different moms that are kind of in my posse. So I try to just have lots of places to go to lay down my burdens so I can spread them around, give everybody a little bit of the sauce. Um, that has helped me. But I think fundamentally being willing to be a burden for somebody who's tried to fix herself all her life would probably be, that's the kind of discomfort that I might want to experiment with. Nice. Um, this question comes from Lisa Mullen Perkins. How is group therapy when someone new joins your group? That could change the dynamic and the value from group therapy. How do you evaluate the ebbs and flows of the benefit of group therapy when people entered and left the group? Hi, Lisa. <laughs> What an awesome question. Um, Lisa and I went to um, high school together. Um, when a new person comes, that is that can be really explosive. It's it's such a it's such a powerful dynamic time because the way it works with Dr. Rosen is he'll announce a month before, I want the group to know we're going to get a new member in four weeks. And during those four weeks while we're waiting for the baby to arrive, right? This is exactly the language we use. All these feelings come up and it's just like a family, but it's all examinable. So the person who was the most recent to come is now no longer going to be the baby. And a lot of times that person feels like, like the new baby is going to come and take the fire and always what happens when a new member comes, everybody's role shifts a little bit. I personally, I'll talk for myself, when there's a new woman and she's younger than I am, <laughs> or um, I perceive her as more attractive or God forbid, a lot thinner, I have a very difficult time. It gets ugly times in there. And I have to do that. Like I have to own that. I have to own all my sister stuff, all my baggage around how I view how I view women as a threat. And my most recent member that was a man, I was when we don't know who's coming. You don't know if it's a man or a woman. Most of the time, sometimes you do know because you hear it on the grapevine. But this one time I was so scared. It was going to be like a super skinny, beautiful woman who's going to get all the attention. She'd have creamy skin and I would just die. And in walks a guy, I'd never seen him before. He was like wearing cargo shorts and tennis shoes. And I, I was so happy. I was just like, tell us about yourself. And everything he said, I laughed at. And everyone was like, you're just so happy it wasn't a woman, <laughs> which is true. I was super busted. So it's a really, it's a really nuclear time. Um, and then it takes a while to fold the person in and haze them and get them up to speed. So it's, that's a great question. No one's asking that. Um, there's a, another anonymous question. And the person says that my group is anonymous, meaning that we do not interact with each other outside of group. What do you see as the benefits of the way your group is structured versus mine? Yeah, I, my understanding is that the norm is groups are supposed to contain all of their interactions within the group because it I had a, a different therapist a friend of mine who's a therapist explain that it keeps the potency in the group and if you have outside liaisons or fraternizing then it dilutes the power of the group and I totally could see that um, for me what I see the value is I, I 
turns out I'm a little needy, guys. And so outside of session, like uh, my sessions are 90 minutes twice a week, but the rest of that time, I might need support. And so I call a group mate or I meet for coffee. There's um, a group of us in non COVID times when the weather cooperates, whatever we meet for coffee and we just, I get to touch the experience. I get to touch my, the experience of being known in the way that my group mates know me outside of group. And it's like extra support. And where that really, really, really saved my life is when I was going through horrific breakups and I was now, now I've learned how to feel my feelings, guys, but Mr. Wright just dumped me on Clark Street and I'm falling apart and I can't wait till Monday morning session. And I would go to group mates houses and just ball into their throw pillows and they would make me eggs and invite me to their Shabbat dinners. And that's when I, I don't, I don't know how that, I don't know how I would have survived. I probably would have if they hadn't been there but I was able to feel genuinely held and there was a place to go and a place to land when I was so sad for so long and that's not possible if we can't we can't see each other outside of group so I'm sort of in favor of how it went down for me but I know there's important reasons why doctors don't do that um this is another anonymous question is there a way your profession as an attorney was advantageous in group therapy? Do you think the intensity of it appealed to you because you're a lawyer? Oh, probably. Pro yes, yes, that was such a good question. Oh my God, woo! Um, I think we that's- a I, We had a breakthrough right here. <laughs> you just saw it, oh my God. I think you're right. I think that I'm super drawn to intense things and so law obviously was a, sort of a, a a good fit and i'm super verbal and i i like talking and and i so i think that that i i don't know that it was an advantage so much as maybe the way i would say it as i think about it now the same qualities in my personality that led me to law also led me to embrace group and what it was offering and it sure helps to be sort of verbal and quick on your feet. If you land in a group where other people are like that, it just, it helps, it helps to feel like you can keep up with the big dogs, you know? Um, this is a question from uh, someone named Jenny and, and she asks, is there something that the leading therapist did during the group sessions that you and the group found enjoyable or beneficial? Um, <laughs> I will say, as somebody who's read the book, Jenny, uh, there's a lot, I'm sure that's a very long answer and you will get many examples of it when you read the book, but I do want to, Christy, if there's something that comes to mind, because I suspect there's some, some mental health professionals on this, like watching this, and they might like to know what were some of the things that, uh, that really helped. I'll say the first two that I was conscious of when I was new to the whole thing. And this is sort of like, sort of basic, but in my first session, Dr. Rosen stopped me very early on and he said, what are you feeling? Which now that seems like that's what therapists do, but I, no one had ever asked me that. And something had just happened in the group. Like, I think I was asked about my sex life right off the bat. And um, I just started talking about my sex life with a bunch of strangers. And um, Dr. Rosen was like, what are you feeling? And I, I, I feel like I didn't know what the answers were and I didn't know what I didn't know what I was feeling and I just was like hot cheeks and I'm trying to get y'all to like me what's that feeling and um so that breaking down in the moment what a feeling is I really needed that and I didn't know I needed that and the other thing is this is sort of global that this is why I cannot ever be a therapist certainly not a group therapist Dr. Rosen has the ability to just let us go when we're fighting to me, I'm like, I would have to intervene. I'm so uncomfortable with other people's intensity or hostility or anger, especially when there's two people going at it. It feels so scary to me. And he just smiles like he's so proud and he's, he's engaged and he's present. And I have seen him spring out of his seat if things go too far. Um, but for the most part, he's got a real 
non-codependent approach, which he's like, he trusts us, he trusts himself, and he trusts the group process. So he lets, he lets us scream and yell and get it all out, which I, I never, obviously, I never seen, I don't know how you see that unless you go to group therapy. I find that incredible, incredible gift, could never do it. I felt like there were a lot of lessons about parenting and how Dr. Rosen um, conducted the group. Yeah, I mean, every day I watch myself just insert myself, bloop, straight in between my son and my daughter. And they're like, what, what are you doing? We're going to work it out. And I'm like, I'm doing the thing, right? And also, what the biggest gift for my parenting from this whole experience is I let my kids have their feelings like and super inconvenient we are late we are late to places because making space for feelings takes time and you can't be on time you can't look good you can't do all that and have feelings right before the piano recital or the family reunion and because he's modeled that for me for almost 20 years I can sort of do it. I say, I often say the right things, although in my head, I'm like, can you just put your shoes on and smile and let's go? But I, I know the value of letting them play it full out. Maybe they won't have to spend years as a bulimic or date people whose hygiene is subpar if I let them do what they need to do now. Mm -hmm. Um. How did your relationship to the group change when you did find Mr. I think this is the right one or when your dreams and goals started coming through? That's a good question too. You know, honestly, the group, the group cheered me on for the most part. Like I never experienced, I mean, there was some smug, like we knew it. We knew he was the one. We hated those other guys. We told you. There's some of that sort of like good natured ribbing. And what that question reminds me of is as I began to let go of being the most single person or desperate Christie's coming in here crying about another man who's not suitable. When I began to let go of that role, I kind of mourned it. I There was a grief associated with the success that I'd come for because I'd spent so many years being padded and past the tissues that I didn't know my new role was gonna be really different and there was gonna be a lot less gnashing and crying. And I had to say goodbye to that part of, of who I was in the group. and as soon soon thereafter somebody else came in the group who was like a earlier version of me and it was time to like pass the baton and sometimes I feel I don't miss it I do not miss being lonely and bereft and uncoupled I don't miss that at all but I do I miss the, the way that people the way the group circled me and held me because I needed it so much that was hard to let go of um, the two people Those have asked questions. same question. Um, what advice do you have for someone who would like to find a group? I think you, I think what I would do is just start calling. I know therapists right now. I have a family member who we were looking for a therapist for my family member. I could barely get any to call me back because therapists are so overloaded right now. So I would say, just know, be patient because COVID times has made people flock to therapy. Um, but so be persistent. And maybe if you're having trouble, ask for a buddy to sit with you or an accountability partner for just making those phone calls. And I think um, what I would do is I just start calling people and ask them or do a start with a Google search. And or if you have people in your life who you know do therapy, a lot of therapists do both. And so there's people in my group who work as therapists. They do see tons of individual and they also run groups. So maybe the therapists, you may know a therapist already and they may run groups. But I find for me, like once I start opening my mouth about something, the stars line up, but it does take some willingness. And I know from my own experience, it's, it's tough time right now. I had a hard time getting a therapist to even call me back so I could discuss the services I needed for somebody else. So. I feel you on that one. Um, I'm curious, what would you say to someone who told you that therapy was self-indulgent now? 
But I, I would say, oh, that just, <laughs> that's such a good point. Cause that's certainly, that's what I was saying before. And yeah. I guess, I guess I would say, and this sounds sort of glib, but like, then join a group because it's not all about you. In group, you serve as, it's like Montessori. You serve as both the witness and the per person who needs a witness. And if you don't want it to be all about you, go share the circle with five other people. And that way you can, if you're, if you want to be more of service or expand your life, group is a great place to shoot the self-indulgent excuse right out of the water. That's a wonderful answer. Um, we are out of time and I want to encourage everyone on this Zoom experience to um, get to order group here at the Harvard Bookstore. And, um, and I want to thank you for sharing your time with us tonight. Uh, it was awesome talking to you. And thank you. This was really fun. You're, the, you're, this, you're like one of my idols. This is like crazy. <laughs> you're so sweet. So um, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to kick it over to the Harvard bookstore again, but, um, but thank you, Christy. Thanks, Sarah. Honestly, thank you both. This was a really wonderful talk. Um, so thanks to Sarah and Christy. Thanks to all of you out there who spent their, your evening with us. You can learn more about this book and purchase group at the link in the chat or just at harvard.com once this disappears. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a great night. Keep reading and please everybody be well. Thank you both. Thank you.